Guten Morgen, good morning uh, from Germany. Eight o'clock in the in the morning, very early. Um, I hope uh, everybody is awake. Uh, we have two guests in this webinar. Uh, one is uh, I start with uh, the older guy. Sorry, <laughs> Cosmos. <laughs> one is ben Armstrong. I know him a bit longer than Cosmos. He's, ben he's not old. He's not old. He's just <laughs> he's less young. He's less young. No, exactly. I'm old. I'm I, I'm I'm the guy. <laughs> so now you already uh, recognize how this uh, web webinar will, will work. We will uh, chat a lot. So Ben Armstrong is uh, sitting in Brisbane, I think, in Australia. So for him, it's already in the evening. And uh, Cosmos, uh, Cosmos, evening of uh, of uh, Thursday. And Cosmos is sitting in uh, near um, Redmond. For him, it's uh, still Wednesday, I think, uh, 11. 11 p.m. So I'm very happy to have you both guys and uh, let me just announce the next webinar. So it uh, will be uh, a demo webinar about Azure Stack HCI, the new features. Uh, it's on Monday, Monday the 23rd of, the 3rd of October uh, at uh, a more civil time, 11, 11 a.m. in the morning. I think we have still summer time then. And uh, I want to uh, propose an offering for this special occasion. So I decided to do both Storage Spaces Direct power courses that are in this year. One is in November and one is in December. For a special, instead of 2,499 euro, you get it for 1,999. So if you are interested in the S2D course, and it is a hybrid course, so you can attend here live in Hallenberg in person, or you can attend remote over Teams. Uh, uh, just mail me uh, the offer still until uh, or stands until the rest of the year. So without further ado, I will uh, switch to Ben's. I hope I can do that because this, this stupid thing is always moving. Yeah, and there is very good news. So we have reached 100, reached over 100 attendees, and so we're now uh, permitted to begin. Yes. So did I uh, did I uh, did I uh, choose the right Ben? I, I'm. I, that is, I have just noticed you are correct. There are two Bens because if I go and look and choose uh, the organizer, it lists Ben Armstrong and Ben Armstrong me. So uh, now I shut up. So uh, one more thing. If you have questions, you can ask questions in the question area in English or in German. I will translate the German questions. And um, these two guys I know love questions. So don't, don't hold back. An answer your questions. Nochmal kurz in Deutsch. Stellt bitte viele Fragen im Fragenteil, auch in Deutsch. Ich würde das übersetzen, wenn, uh, wenn ihr nicht in Englisch uh, schreiben wollt. Und jetzt... Uh, Starting me as a part of the webinar. Uh, ben, go on, please. Awesome. Well, actually, I'm going to uh, throw straight to Cosmos and say, uh, Cosmos, do you want to get this show going? Yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks. So, hi, everybody. Um, I think you you know who we are. My name is Cosmos Darwin. Uh, I'm just going to speak for a, a few minutes here just to sort of provide a little bit of, uh, I guess, context or framing, and then I'm going to hand it over to Ben to do the bulk of the of the really exciting part of today's presentation. Um, I think it's it's just important to sort of explain how we got to this point, because if you're tuning in and you're familiar with Azure Stack HCI, uh, you may you may very well not be familiar with the Azure Kubernetes service, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and I think it's just important to give some context for what this is really all about. At Microsoft, we are committed to building a set of tools and a set of technologies that can empower you to innovate anywhere. And when I say anywhere, I mean whether it is in the public cloud, in a Microsoft data center, or on your premises, in your data center, we are committed to building tools and technologies that help you wherever it makes sense to deploy your applications and to deploy your infrastructure. If you followed Microsoft in the last couple of years, the last one or two years, you've probably noticed we've made a number of big investments and big announcements along this theme. Uh, the biggest one, of course, is Azure Arc, which provides a single control plane where you can actually take a set of management capabilities from Azure and use them with servers that are not in Azure, like Azure Stack HCI. Uh, ben, if you can go to the next slide. Many of you, I imagine, saw this, but just to recap in case you didn't, earlier this year, we announced a pretty significant change and a pretty significant and exciting new direction with Azure Stack HCI. 
we've actually introduced a specialized host operating system that is purpose built for virtualization and that is dedicated for the Azure Stack HCI scenario. It includes the latest version of our hypervisor that you can get your hands on with built in software defined storage and networking. And as you can see from the, the you know, screenshots here, it is a distinctly Azure product. When you turn it on, there's really no way to miss it, right? This is uh, a new purpose built operating system, especially for hyper converged infrastructure. Now, with this operating system, there are a number of new features and new capabilities that are possible, and there's going to be even more of them coming over time. The most important one, I think, to highlight is that it natively integrates with Microsoft Azure. So this OS runs on your servers, on your premises, but you can use Azure to manage it, and it's not complicated to set up. So there's no agent, there's no big fancy script that you have to run. When you finish setting up Azure Stack HCI, it natively expects to connect up to the Azure cloud and give you a seamless hybrid experience where the virtual machines, the apps are running on-prem, but, the, but your, your ability to manage it and see it comes from Microsoft Azure. And in fact, Ben, if you go to the next slide, you'll see we have a screenshot here that actually shows in the Azure portal, you can see your Azure Stack HCI clusters. In this case, I have two clusters and I can see them and I can perform some basic management straight from the Azure portal. Next slide, please. Now, these new capabilities as part of this Azure Stack HCI operating system complement and build on existing hybrid capabilities that we've announced over the last couple of years. So there's hybrid networking where you can securely connect from on-prem into an Azure virtual network. There's the ability to use Azure policy to configure hosts and virtual machines on-premises. These are things that we've announced over the last couple of years as we really shift toward a mindset of making hybrid as easy as possible for you. And if you look closely at this slide, you'll see there's a number of things which are new this year, which are just available in preview now. There's even some more things coming next year and the year after. And one of the things, if you look closely, is Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is uh, rapidly becoming the normal way to deploy new applications. Uh, and we've talked a little bit earlier this year about how this was going to come to Azure Stack HCI. And so that's really the focus of this webinar today. Ben is here. Uh, he leads that project, and he's going to explain what that is all about. What does it mean to bring the Azure Kubernetes service onto Azure Stack HCI as part of this mission to help you innovate anywhere, whether it's in Azure or on-premises? You should get great tools, great technology, and there's no better example of that than AKS. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Ben. Awesome. Thank you for the, uh, the intro. Um, so first, let me talk about uh, AKS. Uh, so AKS is the Azure Kubernetes service. It's uh, what we offer uh, on Azure today. Um, and it's been in the market now for just over two years. Uh, we actually uh, GA'd AKS uh, in June of 2018. Uh, and it is you know, our, our offering to customers where we say, hey, if you have containerized workloads and you've heard about this Kubernetes thing, um, then we provide you uh, a managed experience in Azure um, where we, we follow all the best practices. We have Azure grade security. We give you enterprise support and we make the, the management of that platform simple. Um, and uh, AKS has been hugely popular. Um, it is actually the fastest growing uh, compute service uh, in Azure today. Uh, you know, so every quarter we, we sit down and we look at who's using what. And you know, for the last year, you know, AKS has just been uh, taking off like crazy. Um, and it really, uh, it really provides a great platform for people to run uh, applications that they've containerized. Um, now with that, uh, we've then been chatting to people and there's been a number of things that we've been hearing from uh, the different folk we've been chatting to. The first one that we've heard is, you know, uh, hey, I, I, I want to be able to rank my applications for Azure, but then run them in my data center. You know, and this is where we have uh, customers who have been writing containerized apps, running them on AKS, being super happy with that. Um, but then they find that they have a business need to do that in their data center. Uh, you know, maybe there's compliance needs, maybe there's a new business opportunity, maybe there's been some structural change in the company, and they now need to run this in their data center. 
um, and they don't want to have to, to throw out the work that they did getting their application running in Azure. The next conversation uh, that we've had a lot of is this, don't tell me that I'm gonna need more people to manage and maintain my application infrastructure. And what this really is, is that for a lot of enterprise companies that we talk to, um, they have uh, administrators and operators um, and they have developers. And for a long time, the administrators and operators have focused on delivering a great virtual machine platform and developers have written stuff um, inside those virtual machines. Um, and as uh, containerization has become more popular and as people have been looking at it, there's this realization that like, oh, to do containerization properly and in a production way, there's a whole bunch more infrastructure that we need to bring in. Uh, but no one wants to, to hire more people to do that. Um, and so we're talking to a, a lot of companies right now where uh, there's kind of this, this argument happening between their developer groups and their infrastructure groups about who's gonna you know, like support and maintain all this. Um, and no one's you know wanting to go like, oh, you know, I'll go hire more people to do this. Um, the final uh, conversation we've been having a lot uh, with a lot of customers is uh, they're, they're listening to what we're talking about with hybrid cloud and with all the innovations that we're putting into the Azure platform. And they're going, you know, on one hand, I, I get this. I, I see the, the value of this. Um, however, at the same time, I have a bunch of existing applications. Um, I have ASP.NET applications, I have SQL, I have you know, a, a large set of uh, on-prem applications, and I can't just throw those out. Um, I need to have a, a solution that helps me to move those forward um, to maintain the, the investment that I've made there and to also uh, evolve those. Um, and so that's where we started working on AKS on Azure Stack HCI. So what is AKS on Azure Stack HCI? Well, I, 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 the name is pretty descriptive. Um, you know, what we have done with AKS on Azure Stack HCI is we have taken uh, all the technology that we use to build AKS um, and we're making it available um, for you to run in your data center uh, on Azure Stack HCI. Um, and the, the great thing to call out here is that this was actually a lot easier than it could have been for us to do uh, because Azure Stack HCI and Azure both run on Windows Server. Um, they both run on Hyper-V. Um, and so a lot of the architecture uh, was portable. Uh, so when we do this, there are a couple of big things that we think we bring to the table. Um, the first one is that we bring a consistent experience that's easy to deploy. Um, you know, so one of the, the, when we talk to people about what they like about AKS, one of the things that they like about AKS is that they don't have to get their hands dirty with all of the inner workings of Kubernetes. Um, the, the solution we've built with AKS on Azure is you can go to the Azure portal and you can say, I want a Kubernetes cluster. We ask you a handful of questions and then we go like, there, it's all done. And, and we've spun up a bunch of infrastructure behind the scenes that we're managing for you. Um, and we wanted to do the same uh, with uh, AKS on Azure Stack HCI. Now, at the same time that we're trying to deliver that, we're also trying to do it in a way that makes sense for customers' data centers. Um, so we've built an experience where on one hand, we've tried to make it consistent and similar to what you experience with AKS in Azure. Um, but on the other hand, we've built it so that it's through Windows Admin Center and it's through PowerShell so that you sit down uh, with, your, with your Azure Stack HCI deployment um, you go through Windows Admin Center and you deploy it uh, in a way that you're already very familiar with. And with that, I'm going to uh, go over, uh, do my first demo. Now, this demo is a cheat. It is a video demo. Um, I'll be doing a live demo later on. Um, and the reason why I, I went with the video demo uh, for this um, is 
I did not have enough hardware infrastructure sitting around to do both demos live, um, and I would rather do my second demo live. Uh, but this is a, uh, a video of just what the process looks like. Now, this video has been sped up for the, the sake of not having this take for, forever. Um, if I go through this myself um, in my home office, this whole process takes about 45 minutes. And we have not skipped out any screens here. We've just sped up uh, downloads and, and, and different options. So here I've got Windows Admin Center. Um, and I'm going through the experience of enabling an Azure Stack HCI deployment to be an AKS host. And so what we've done is we've basically gone through, we've said we want to do it, where we want to store things, and we've provided an Azure subscription for billing. And that is all the information. And we now have a platform that we can use to deploy Kubernetes clusters. Um, and here, just to show this experience, we've tried to make as similar to the AKS experience uh, as possible. Um, so for deploying a Kubernetes cluster, once again, it's a very simple wizard. I go through, I say if I want an ARC connection, if I do, where I, you know, what resource group, I specify my cluster name, I specify if I want Linux and Windows worker notes, um, I provide some basic networking information, um, and that is pretty much it. Now, as I said, this video is sped up. Um, so end to end uh, in my system, it takes about 45 minutes. And I have a live demo that I'll be doing in a little bit where I basically pick up at the end of this demo um, and start playing with the system uh, to show you what it looks like. Ben? Yes. Ben? Uh, I have one question, one remark for you. Um, so I will uh, I will bring it in now, uh, and I know the answer, and I think the questionnaire also uh, knows the answer. What if I'm not, uh, uh, I mean, not at all connected back to the internet, AKA dark side? I add this sure. he, uh, if we can use Azure um, uh, Kubernetes on Azure Stack HCI. So the 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 first disclaimer is we think there's a lot of value and having uh, a connection to Azure Arc, and there's a lot of capabilities that uh, come through that. However, you can go through and do most of this disconnected. We do have a requirement for connection for billing, um, and that requirement basically will uh, need uh, require that the system be able to connect to the, the internet um, you know, basically every couple of weeks in order to report billing information. Um, we are kind of, we're, first, we're interested to see what people are looking for here and what their requirements are. Um, we have been working with a number of our preview customers to try and make this as easy to deploy um, in you know, enterprise data centers as possible. Um, so for instance, one of the, uh, it's not in the current public preview build that we have out, but we have engineers working on an update for this where we are going to allow you to specify for AKS HCI, uh, hey, I need to sit this behind a firewall and behind a proxy. Please have anyone who connects to the internet go through this proxy. Uh, yeah. So we are trying to work through those different issues. Uh, but at a bare minimum, systems need to be able to connect to, to Azure every couple of weeks to report billing information. Mm -hmm. Um, Additional question yep. uh, from Elma, sorry. Uh, can I use Azure Stack Hub to manage Azure Stack HCI OS, uh, other ARC-enabled services? Or are there so, plans that maybe? So, yeah, so uh, the short answer is you can. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly uh, what we want to do. That is, a, uh, that is something that we have discussed as a potential way to do fully disconnected. Um, where we have discussed that like, hey, you know, maybe a way that we can do fully disconnected is by having our billing services running on a local deployment of Azure Stack Hub. I don't know if that's something that we're going to do, um, but generically speaking, yes, you can use Azure Stack Hub um, to, to manage a, an AKS HCI deployment. Okay, yeah. cool. So the, the, the caveat there, if I can add, is that we uh, we would need to basically bring uh, a certain set of uh, resource providers and services onto Azure Stack Hub, which as Ben alluded to, we are absolutely discussing, but uh, the Azure Stack HCI one, for example, is not there yet, right? So we recently added 
support for the West Europe region, but we don't yet have support for Azure Stack Hub. Cool. So then Elmer, uh, the questions were from Elmer. He mentioned, uh, he asked me to also mention VS Lab for demo stuff. And Absolutely. so it's not from Jaromir, it's from Elmer. And I think that's a great <laughs> hint. Uh, Jaromir is doing great work there. Um, so try it out. VS Lab, uh, try VS Lab. It's on GitHub. Yeah, I will give a, a big call out uh, if you're uh, familiar with with WS Lab for, for trying out uh, various Microsoft server technologies. Uh, Yaramir did a great job of jumping on and, and getting AKS HCI set up through that. Uh, yeah, so, that's cool. And I have that, another question and then we then we stop, okay? I, I <laughs> if, it's, if it's the CSI question, we'll get to that later. Okay, so you have seen it, okay. So then go on, so please, that, Ben. I, 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 I have a... a I have a leading question for you, though, Ben, if I may. Yeah, absolutely. So you deployed in that video uh, AKS onto an Azure Stack HCI cluster. Um, is the AKS control plane? This is a, le a leading question. I know the answer. Yeah, but is the is, is the a, control I, plane I, I, actually I'm running on? That in my second demo. Ah, great. Okay, cool. Hold that question, Cosmos. We're gonna. I'm gonna have fun with my second demo. We're gonna pull apart uh, an AKS HCI deployment and see a bit of uh, what's behind the covers. Cool, sounds great. Uh, so anyway, uh, getting back. So, uh, uh, you know, so we made this consistent and, and easy to, to deploy, but we've also done a lot of work to make it uh, consistent throughout the entire stack. Um, so a couple of things, uh, the first one is, um, as much as possible, we connect to Azure technologies uh, by default. So as you go through the flow, it's easy to connect to Arc. It's easy to connect to Azure Monitor. It's easy to connect to, to Azure Policy. Um, so all the the experience that you get running AKS in Azure, you get uh, when you're running AKS on Azure Stack HCI. Um, at the same time, we've done a lot of work on making sure that apps are consistent. Um, so we want you to be able to build an app uh, in your data center, move it to Azure. Um, we want you to be able to build an app in Azure, move it to your data center. Um, and a big part of that is we also want to make sure that there is practically uh, no uh, like kind of retraining needed. Um, one of the things that we've always heard from, from users that they like about Microsoft is the transferable skills. Um, and one of the things that actually makes me particularly happy, as we've been working on uh, AKS HCI, uh, we have frequently done uh, internal bug bash events where we get a bunch of people together and say, like, deploy AKS HCI, try stuff out. And if I have a, a new person to that, that process and they're like, okay, I got AKS uh, HCI up and running, what should I do now? Uh, my first stop is to say, go read the AKS tutorials and just follow the AKS tutorials. Yes, they're written for AKS in Azure, but those tutorials work perfectly uh, in AKS HCI. And the final thing to call out is, um, just like Windows Server, just like Hyper-V, um, AKS, uh, AKS HCI uh, share a common code base. Um, so we have a, a team at Microsoft that maintains the, the Kubernetes code, um, that's used by AKS, and AKS HCI uses the same code to try and ensure uh, the highest level of compatibility possible. So I've talked about consistent user experience and a consistent platform. Um, the next thing that we think is, is really important is uh, AKS HCI runs both Linux and Windows uh, containers on a single deployment, um, all managed for you. Um, and this is actually a really uh, big deal. Um, and for this one, I'm gonna jump over to my second demo, um, which is where uh, I'm gonna have a lot of fun uh, pulling apart an AKS HCI deployment. Um, so let's uh, switch across to, here we go. There we go. So hopefully folk can see that. Can you uh, read the text in my command prompt? It looks good to me. Awesome. 
Um, so this is, uh, first I will call out, and this should be the least surprising thing uh, to anyone, is yes, I am running uh, this all nested on Hyper-V. Uh, I kind of like that product. Uh, hey, 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 Ben, you need to you need to pay for Windows. Me too, I, me I, too. I, I know, look at that, it's terrible. Um, so, um, so th uh, this is a system where I went through, so uh, my setup here, I have a private domain, I have Azure Stack HCI, um, I went through and I did the deployment process that I showed in the video. Um, as I mentioned, it, it took about uh, 45 minutes. Um, and I got to the end and this is our, our finish page where we say like, hey, you've created a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and we give you a couple of things. So the first one we give you is we, if you chose to connect to Arc, uh, which I did, uh, we give you this link to, to open up in Arc. Um, and here's uh, my cluster uh, in Arc. I do, when I'm self-hosting, name all my clusters after Pokemon. Um, so this is the, the Pikachu cluster, um, where you can see that I'm running uh, Kubernetes 1.18.6. Uh, I have three nodes. Um, and I can come in here and I can use the, the various ARC integration. I can deploy configurations on it through ARC. Um, I can use uh, policy. I can use uh, insights, um, a bunch of, of really cool things. Uh, but I'm not going to spend much time there. Now, I will call out uh, most of this demo I'm going to be in PowerShell. Um, that is largely because this is a early public preview of AKS HCI. We do uh, fully intend to build a very pretty uh, Windows Admin Center dashboard uh, for managing and interacting with your Kubernetes cluster, um, but uh, that is not yet complete. Um, and this is on the roadmap, right? This is on the roadmap, uh, which we'll, uh, we'll get to in a bit. Can I, can I call out one other thing as well? Um, yep. you, you mentioned very casually there that the Kubernetes version that Pikachu is running is uh, 1.18, I believe, right? Yes. Um, just, you know, because you, you mentioned the common code base between AKS and AKS on Azure Stack HCI. This is actually one of the places already where that shines because we're talking about a brand new product that's just been in preview for a few weeks, and it is running a more recent Kubernetes version than is available anywhere in, Am in Amazon, in EKS. Yeah, this um, is true. They only go up to version 1.17, and like it just sort of goes to show how how um, cutting edge and how beneficial it is to have the common code base between Azure Public Cloud and what you get on HCI. You really do get the latest on HCI. Yeah. So uh, so with it, with this deployment, uh, I went through and I did what we showed in the demo, where I enabled my Azure Stack uh, HCI. Uh, system to be an AKS host. Um, I then went through and I deployed the Pikachu cluster and I asked to have uh, one Linux worker node and one Windows uh, worker node. Um, and I've got to the end, I've got this link to Arc. Um, it also gives me the option to download the kubeconfig file, which is what I need for the various uh, open source tools. Now I have downloaded that um, and I have that uh, all set up uh, and ready to go here. So if I go over uh, to my command line, um, and let me get my, my cheats ready. Um, so the first thing I can do um, is I can run a command line tool, uh, kubectl, um, get nodes. Um, so this tells me like, oh, so you have uh, the, your Kubernetes cluster, your Pikachu cluster, um, you have the control plane, um, and you have a Linux worker node and a Windows worker node. Um, I see a question, what about the K8's dashboard? Uh, you can absolutely uh, enable the K8's dashboard. We actually had some early private preview builds where we enabled the K8's dashboard. Uh, we stopped enabling it by default because in the last couple of months, um, there have been a number of security issues discovered in the open source K8's dashboard. Um, and so a lot of the Kubernetes community is now saying, uh, only enable it if you really know what you're doing. So we decided we didn't want to enable it by default, um, and we didn't want to use it in our demos. But you can you can you can enable it and and it's fine. Um, do be aware that there are some security concerns around the case dashboard. Basically, uh, yeah, it gives you too much control over your Kubernetes cluster. Um, so yeah, it is really pretty. It is really pretty. I am a bit bummed that I wasn't uh, able to uh, to use it 
But as I said, we are working on a, a Windows Admin Center dashboard as well. Um, but anyway, so this is uh, the view that I get from the, the open source uh, tools for Kubernetes. Um, but what's actually happened under the covers? So under the covers, uh, when I went through and said, enable this for, for an AKS HCI host, uh, AK, AF, and create a cluster, uh, we spun up a bunch of virtual machines. Um, so what does that look like? Let's uh, have a look. Let's do a, a get VM. Um, so this is a clean deployment um, of Azure Stack HCI, and now I magically have uh, five virtual machines. What are these five virtual machines? Uh, so let's step through them. So the first two that we see are my AKS management cluster virtual machines. This is my control plane and my load balancer. And these are two virtual machines that provide the platform for spinning up multiple Kubernetes clusters. Um, we occasionally internally refer to this as our bootstrap cluster. It is our Kubernetes cluster that fires up Kubernetes clusters. Um, and then I have four virtual machines that make up my Pikachu cluster. There's the control plane, um, there's a load balancer, and then you can see here, there's my uh, Linux worker node and my Windows worker node. Now, the fun thing about this is I never have to touch those or think about those because what we're doing with AKS HCI is we create a set of virtual hard drives and container images that we maintain, we keep patched, we update, um, we put them on the Microsoft CDN infrastructure. Um, and I talked about the deployment process takes about 45 minutes. Um, that's because we're pulling down a bunch of EHDs and stuff. Um, you know, so when you do a deployment, um, we are pulling down VHDs that we need to be able to compose and build all this uh, system. Now, this has a, a number of advantages. Um, the first one is we take care of keeping those patched and secure and up to date. We have an update infrastructure where as security updates come out, we push out new VHDs, you pull them down um, and life is good. Um, and yes, uh, the, the next one, we manage the complexity of the configuration. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I did not have to specify as I was doing this because we're just like, yes, um, you'll need storage, you'll need software-defined networking, you'll need uh, a whole bunch of different things. And we just handle that for you. Um, and the, the really fun thing is like, yeah, it's great to go in and look behind the system, uh, behind the curtain, but if all I want to do is deploy some containers, then I can just focus on what I want to do, which is to run my apps. Um, so those those are my VMs uh, that make this uh, up this system. But if we come back, uh, so in Kubernetes, uh, you have the term nodes, um, you have pods, and pods are what containers are running. Um, so this is a fresh deployment, um, and if I run kubectl get pods, uh, it tells me there are no pods. Uh, but there actually are a bunch of pods that we maintain for you. Um, so if I come in here and say kubectl get pods all namespaces, um, this is actually all the, the infrastructure that got deployed. Um, so I'm not gonna go through um, every single one of these, um, but we have the, the Azure Arc components uh, that we've installed. We have a DNS server that we've installed internally. Uh, we have CSI, which is our, our storage uh, that Cosmos will be talking about later on. We have our etcd database uh, that we manage for you. We have the, the control manager, the API server. We have Flannel that gives us the, the network virtualization. We have proxy servers. All of this we configure for you. Um, all of this we maintain for you. All of this, every single container here, I have engineers who are on point for making sure that if there are any security updates, any fixes, um, these get patched and we test this entire system uh, end to end to make sure that it works well together. So. Now that I've done that, let's step through uh, deploying a couple of apps. Um, so I have uh, two apps that I wanna deploy, um, and I just wanna kind of step folk through uh, the Kubernetes way of doing this, um, which is to use YAML files. Um, now, if we uh, open these up, uh, I have two of these side by side. So I'm looking at the questions. Uh, Andreas says, sounds buggy. It definitely is not. 
um, because we make this all work together. A really fun one uh, to, uh, to, to share with you all is uh, as part of uh, coming out with public preview, um, we did a lot of reliability and scale testing on the platform. Um, every day when we uh, do our daily build, uh, we actually have a build pipeline that uh, deploys uh, and, and destroys 100 Kubernetes clusters uh, using the build. Um, and before we release the public preview, we actually were able to do a scale test where we took a four node uh, Azure Stack HCI cluster and ran over 10,000 containers on it. Um, so you know, that, was, uh, that was really impressive to see. Um, I see a question from uh, Yaramir. Uh, how is it possible that you run the code on your Windows 10 machine? Uh, yeah, I'm doing this all remote management. Um, all the open source tools uh, support remote management. Um, so I went through the experience, downloaded my kubeconfig, um, and I, I run the, the open source tools remotely from my Windows 10 machine, and it all works beautifully. Um, so anyway. Ben, so short, the, uh, ben let, me, let me ask a question. So I see two uh, comments that the sound is not very good. Uh, question to the audience. Have you sound problems? If so, please uh, um, go out of the webinar and come in again for the people who have sound problems. Okay. Uh, so yeah, okay. uh, Jaromir, uh, I, uh, the way I set this up, I just hit download. Um, and copy the, the kubeconfig um, into the default location for kubeconfig so that I can run kubectl and uh, it connects to, to my cluster that I've deployed. Uh, and that's actually something that we want to make even simpler in the future. We have uh, uh, some thoughts about making it really easy to uh, set up the, the command line tools. So anyway, so I have these two YAML files and a lot of people, when they look at these YAML files, go like, ah, that's, that's kind of complicated. Um, and yes, if you're, if you're not familiar with uh, YAML files, you look at this and go, oh, that's kind of complicated. However, what I like to point out to people is, um, I have spent the last 20 years of my life um, trying to make it less complicated for folk to, deploy server applications. So if we go back 20 years in time, um, so here my one on the left is a Windows.ASP uh, application. Um, uh, 20 years ago, if I was a developer working at an enterprise and I wanted to uh, deploy a new Windows ASP application, um, this would have started by writing up a business justification to the finance team so that they could go and buy a new physical server because every web server I want to deploy needed a physical server. Um, let me tell you, yeah, yeah, good point. It wouldn't have been ASP, it would have been an IIS app. Um, but let me tell you, this YAML is a lot simpler than what it used to be. Um, then, you know, 10 years ago, virtual machines are coming on the rise, and virtual machines were a lot more simpler than physical computers. But for a virtual machine, I still had to install operating systems. I had to manage operating systems. I had to configure storage. I had to configure networking. I had to, you know, the, the, the manual process of uh, deploying uh, a web app on a virtual machine requires a lot of work. Now, it is complexity that a lot of us don't think about because we learned it all and we're now used to it. Uh, but you know, if you know, you're someone who's new to the problem, the task of putting together one of these YAML files as opposed to building a virtual machine, installing an OS, getting it all set up, um, I think you'll find that the YAML file is a lot quicker and simpler. So let's step through this. It's also... Uh, if, if I may point out, and it's also worth noting that like in the course of being like an infrastructure admin or a, an ops person, you don't really author these from scratch, right? These are, this is the same YAML that works just as, just as well in AKS and Azure. It basically is a part of the application that's being deployed. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's step through this quickly. Um, so both of these, you'll, uh, you'll see that there's a lot of similarities between them. Um, they're both deployments. Um, one of them is my Windows ASP app. 
and one of my, them is my Linux container running Nginx. Um, for Kubernetes, you can specify how many replicas you want. Um, so if you want redundant copies, change this number to whatever you want. Um, once again, I have just some labels here. Um, then this is a fun one. This is my node selector. And this is really important on a cluster like the one that I have, uh, because this is saying I want my Windows app to run on my Windows nodes, and I want my Linux apps to run on my Linux nodes. Um, if you don't put this in, Kubernetes may well try and schedule your Linux container on a Windows worker node and vice versa, and that definitely won't work. Um, then we come into the container spec. Um, and here, the core thing is I have my image. Um, so one of these I'm pulling from the Microsoft MCR. The other one I'm just pulling from Docker Hub. Um, you can also specify uh, Azure Container Registry, or if you're using an open source on-prem registry, that also works. Um, so then I can specify some limits. Um, and these are particularly fun because what I can, what these actually say is there's limits and requests. So the request tells Kubernetes, hey, do not schedule this container uh, on a worker node that ha doesn't have 300 meg of RAM available um, and doesn't have 10% uh, of a CPU available. Um, the limit, on the other hand, says to Kubernetes, hey, I know my web app, and it should never use more than 800 meg of memory. And if it's using more than 800 meg of memory, something's gone wrong, it's leaking memory. Uh, so if you see it go over this limit, um, restart the container for me. So I can spec then I specify the port for both of those. Um, and finally, I specify, hey, I want these exposed on my load balancer um, so I can have access to them. So those are my YAML files. Um, and let's go ahead and deploy those um, to my Kubernetes cluster. So, uh, uh, uh. so first I'll deploy my Windows, then I'll deploy my Linux YAML file. Um, and now if I go back and I have a look at my pods, um, you can see that my Windows pod is already running, uh, my Linux pod is being created, uh, both my apps are now running. Um, and to prove that, um, I can go and I can have a look at the, the load balancer. Um, it tells me that it's up and running, it tells me that we're on this IP address. Um, so if I come over here, I can go, there's my Linux uh, Engine X app running uh, on port 80 on my load balancer, and I put my Windows app on port 81. Uh, so just see if that comes up, and there we go. Um, so I was able to deploy both of these uh, without having to worry about setting up those virtual machines, running all that infrastructure. Um, and as I said, this is a very simple little demo. I'm just running two containers. But internally, we've used this to run thousands and thousands of containers uh, when we're doing our, our scale and test uh, environments. So with that, I'm going to uh, move back to my uh, PowerPoint. Um, I actually will pause for a moment and say, Kostin, is there anything you're curious about that you want to see before I uh, move back to PowerPoint? Yeah, as an as an Kubernetes novice, I'm really impressed. Uh, it looks it looks really easy, so I, I'm looking forward to try it out. That, that is the goal. I actually one of the ones that uh, one of the videos that I love that we put together for Ignite um, was we actually had uh, Vinicius and Sabot on the the Hyper-V team um, sat down and in 20 minutes they stepped through the process of taking an ASP.NET app running on a Windows Server 2012 R2 uh, virtual machine. Uh, it was without any access to the code, they uh, extracted um, the ASP.NET app, turned it into a web deploy package, turned that into a container, and then deployed it uh, onto AKS HCI uh, on the same infrastructure. Cool. So with that, let me... Switch back to PowerPoint. This all sorted. So I see Yaramir asking, uh, are the scale tests available on GitHub? Uh, they are not yet, but uh, I'll, I, I'll definitely uh, mention to 
uh, the engineers that built it that there's interest. So I've just showed uh, Linux and Windows containers uh, running. Um, the the final uh, big advantage that we see for AKS HCI is security. Um, and there's a couple of things to talk about here. Um, the first one is, uh, and I've already mentioned this multiple times, we provide and manage all the host and container images that make up AKS HCI for you. Um, it is, uh, they're, they're, it's a sizable engineering effort to keep track of all the components required to build a Kubernetes deployment and to ensure that as uh, security issues are discovered, patches are created, they're tested, validated, and made available. Um, and we manage that all for you. Um, and that is, that is a big win uh, right there. Um, the next thing now, these things are not in the current uh, public preview that we have out. Uh, they are in our roadmap. We have the team actively working on them. There's a, a set of investments that we're working on to uh, harden the core uh, Kubernetes security for AKS HCI. Um, so the first one is we're actually building a, a zero touch certificate authority uh, for Kubernetes um, that is going to be an extension of Active Directory. So if you have Active Directory in your environment and you want to, to use Kubernetes, you want to deploy applications, and you want to use certificates to secure those applications, um, that is going to be incredibly easy to do. Um, the second thing that we're working on is we're working on integration of the Kubernetes role-based authentication uh, with Active Directory. Um, so if you've played with Kubernetes before, uh, you'll have seen a lot of you know, SSH hashtag uh, you know, tokens and, and so on. We're going to update it so that, and I actually uh, had a demo from the engineering team just the other day uh, where they showed me a kubeconfig file uh, where when you open the kubeconfig file, the contents in there were actually uh, AD uh, security identifiers. Um, and what that means is it'll allow you to go, be able to deploy this and then go into Active Directory and specify groups and users who are going to have access to different parts, you know, access to different Kubernetes clusters, access to the platform itself, and manage it just like you would uh, any other Microsoft property. The final area from the, the core investment um, is we're doing a bunch of work to uh, support uh, GM, uh, GMSA for Windows workloads in a very elegant way. Um, and what I mean by that is with the current public preview, um, you can use GMSA to have your Windows containers access Active Directory resources, um, but it's a very manual process. Um, what we're working on is we're working on automating that whole process so that eventually uh, when you're deploying a Kubernetes cluster, uh, we will ask you like effectively, do you want to uh, join this Kubernetes cluster to a domain. And if you say yes, then any application you deploy on that domain, uh, sorry, on that Kubernetes cluster are going to have access to those domain uh, resources. Um, so we're really excited uh, about all of that. Um, and the final thing that we're working on is we're working on integrating with uh, the larger Microsoft security ecosystem. Um, so hopefully you all have been seeing all the great work we've been doing around Azure Sentinel and around Azure Security Center. Um, we're actively working with those teams to make sure that we have tight integration uh, with AKS HCI as well. Ben, question? Yep. Um, the update of the uh, Kubernetes components are done over uh, Windows update or the Azure, integ Azure Stack uh, HCI integrated update, or how is, how is it done? Uh, so the uh, from the back end, we're actually using the Windows Update infrastructure because it's the most efficient way to, to distribute updates of that nature. Um, but we are actually going to have an update experience that's also integrated into the AKS HCI portal and into the AKS HCI uh, PowerShell um, experience. So the answer is kind of Thanks. all of the above, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and makes sense. Things. For what it's worth with Azure Stack HCI updates, we, we're, do, we're doing a similar thing. We're using Windows Update behind the scenes because it is just rock solid. Yeah, we have years and years of investment in making that a great platform for delivering updates around the world. It is the Santa Claus of patch delivery. 
so with that uh, i guess it yeah uh, when do we see people using uh aks on azure stack aci well i kind of touched on the first two earlier on in the deck um but the, the first scenario that we see is people who have existing Windows uh, applications and they want to modernize them. Um, they want to figure out, you know, hey, I have all these apps that we were running on physical computers. We moved them to virtual machines. We got a bunch of, you know, efficiency savings in doing that. Now what? You know, and moving to containers is the, the next step in that journey. And AKS uh, on a H, uh, HCI gives you a great platform for doing that. Um, it's also great for building new cloud native applications. But the third thing that I want to talk about, which I haven't touched on so far, is that at Microsoft, we are building a, a new wave of you know, first party Microsoft applications that are designed to run on platforms like AKS and, and Azure Stack ACI. Um, and one of the ones that we uh, launched at Ignite and talked a lot about um, was Arc enabled data services. This is a highly scalable uh, database platform developed by the SQL team um, that you can run on top of uh, AKS HCI um, in order to get a scalable database service that is accessible to your containerized applications. Um, and this is actually what we view as kind of one of our unique strengths in this uh, in this place is you know, if you think about, you know, application modernization and containerizing apps and the different solutions that are out there, uh, Microsoft is the only vendor um, that has offerings at every layer in the stack. Um, you know, going from the, the bottom to the top, uh, we have our, you know, validated hardware that we're, we work with all the OEMs and our partners uh, on. We have, you know, the OS, we have Azure Stack HCI, we have, you know, the, the SDN, the, the storage uh, virtualization technology. On top of that, we provide AKS, where we manage all the components for you. Um, you know, you don't have to, you know, build Linux worker nodes, you don't have to build Windows worker nodes, you don't have to build all that infrastructure, it's managed for you. On top of that, we provide Things like Azure Arc, Azure Arc uh, for data services. Um, we have another a number of other offerings that are in the pipeline. And then on top of that, you can run your applications. Um, and so this is a very uh, complete picture. So I'm going to pause and look at a question that just came in. So a question from Dio, what percentage of existing apps of all kinds that Microsoft see are capable of being migrated to AKS without much effort? Um, I do not know a percentage number, uh, to be honest. Uh, as a scenario, uh, it's one that we care about a lot. We actually have an entire team um, in my org that is the, their, the title is the Windows Lift and Shift Team. And their focus is on making sure that we have the right compatibility and the right tooling so that people can take uh, existing apps um that they've they've written and just bring them across uh one of the things we do spend a lot of time talking about right now is asp.net apps because we know that 99 percent of asp.net apps um do just lift and shift across to, to container platform um but it's something that we're continuously working on um, and, and, so, yep and some, something if i can add ben uh i think a, a good thing to underscore here is that uh we're not expecting any any customer or any organization to go from having all their apps not containerized one day to having all their apps containerized the next day, right? I mean, that's not even the case for us internally at Microsoft, right? We have a mix. Some things are containerized, yeah. some things aren't. Uh, and that's one of the reasons it's so important that like, just as you can run Kubernetes clusters alongside other virtual machines in Azure Public Cloud, you can do the same thing on Azure Stack HCI on your premises. You can run some applications in virtual machines, other ones that have been containerized on Kubernetes side by side, and they don't get in each other's way. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really good point to, to bring out. Um, and it's actually, it's one of the things I mentioned, we we have the scaling video that we, uh, we uh, had at Ignite. Um, we did that all on a single Azure Stack HCI deployment. 
uh, we took an Azure Stack HCI deployment where uh, we had a bunch of VMs uh, running on there already with a bunch of apps. Um, we deployed AKS on that side by side. Works great, fully supported. Um, we were then able to go into, into one of those VMs, package up the app, move it across. Um, the whole time we're keeping the source VM there running so that if there is an issue, we still have that there running. Once we have the app up and running uh, on AKS, great, let's get rid of the VM, free up that resource, move on to the next one. So with that, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the architecture. Um, now, thankfully, this is fairly boring um, because I actually showed a lot of it um, in my demo. You know, at the at the high level, um, you know, from the top, we have you know Arc and we have Windows Admin Center and we have PowerShell that give our user experience. Um, and as the uh, as the end user, uh, you can live in those and never worry about what's behind the curtain. But behind the curtain, what we have um, going from the the bottom up, obviously we have you know Azure Stack HCI is the platform we run on, um, and then on top of that. Um, we actually, I'll, I'll dig in, this is a very simplified diagram. Um, we actually have a set of uh, agents that we install on Azure Stack HCI that provide the infrastructure we need for, for deploying and managing virtual machines and having open source interactivity. Um, we then use that to deploy the, the Linux and Windows virtual machines that I showed you in the list, where we have virtual machines that make up the control plane, and we have the virtual machines that are the worker nodes where you run your containers. Now in those virtual machines, we have Linux, we have Windows, we have all the Kubernetes components. Um, we also have a number of open source projects that Microsoft has either contributed to or has created from scratch. Um, we have the cluster API project, which you can go and find on GitHub right now, um, which is the uh, code that allows Kubernetes to talk to Azure Stack HCI. Um, so when uh, when we go, hey, I want a new Windows worker node, uh, Kubernetes goes to Azure Stack HCI and says, give me a Windows worker node. Um, and it's the cluster API that allows it to do that. Um, we have the CNI, which is our network integration. Um, and we have the, the CSI, which is our storage integration. And with that, I'm gonna pass across to Cosmos to talk about the CSI side of the world. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Cool, wonderful. Yeah, so as, as I think Ben has done an amazing job of kind of painting the picture here, there's a ton of shared componentry when you're running AKS on Azure Stack HCI that is common code between AKS on HCI and AKS when you're running it up in Azure Public Cloud. Uh, and that's, you know, that has a, a, a bunch of benefits as we've talked about. Um, but as Ben highlighted, there are a few pieces that were, were built, you know, by many teams actually across the core operating systems group within Microsoft uh, over the last two years or so in order to make it possible to deliver the same push button AKS experience on an HCI cluster that you get in the public cloud. Because of course, the minimum footprint, and actually, Ben, I don't know if we talked about this, but the minimum footprint that you need is not big. This thing is not assuming that you have a whole data center. I, I run it on like a beefy computer with 128 gig of RAM under my desk, right? Um, yeah. And so, in, in order to sort of package up the entirety of the Azure Kubernetes service control plane and bring that onto Azure Stack HCI so that it delivers an experience that is just as easy to use as in Azure, there were some custom pieces that we had to build. And one of them was built by the Storage Spaces Direct team, the team that I'm a part of, um, in order to make it possible to mount storage capacity from uh, the, the, the infrastructure of Azure Stack HCI from Storage Spaces Direct up into running pods that are being managed by Kubernetes. And I wanted to take a moment to sort of explain how it is that that works. Um, to, to start us off with a sort of common foundational knowledge, I'll just spend a, a brief moment recapping the storage architecture when you're using Azure Stack HCI just for virtual machine workloads. Um, and so here you have a diagram that sort of represents that. Uh, ben, you'll have to start. Actually, here, what I, was just, I, just I was just about to say, if you want, just like say, click or something, because this is you. You've got a million builds in this. Why don't I just make myself a presenter? Yeah, um, can you do that? Because if you have access to this PowerPoint, if you can present this PowerPoint, I do. Um, are you seeing I, my well, screen right well, now? 
Uh, I am. Uh, yes, I am. While you were kidding. Yeah, that is beautiful. Um, cool. I will actually just call out because I saw the the mm -hmm. person smiling about the comparison to uh, Tanzu, um, and you talked about the scale. Um, the the two things that I do want to call out. Uh, the first one is that yeah, from an architectural and a capability point of view, um, AKS HCI is industry leading. Um, it is uh super fun to be able to take all the the work and innovation that we've done in aks and bring it over to to azure stack hci and there's a lot of stuff where you know our our competition uh on prem um is still catching up to what we've been doing uh in the in the public cloud um the the second thing that i will call out which is actually kind of interesting to call out is because uh, of the integration of AKS with Azure Stack HCI, um, and because of the historic focus of Azure Stack HCI um, on all the different scale points, uh, to the best of my knowledge, AKS uh, HCI is the only on-prem Kubernetes offering that will give you a highly available container platform on two nodes. Yep, that is every, true. Every every other on-prem uh, Kubernetes offering requires three or more nodes. And uh, often for, it's not often it's not three. Often it's more. Yeah, <laughs> like often, five. yeah often, often it's more. Um, so if you're if you're looking at you know a branch office or or a small medium business, and you know two computers is uh, a two node cluster is the right scale point, um, then AKS HCI is the solution. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, okay, so uh, Ben talked about, you know, from an architectural standpoint, uh, you know, really focusing on making sure that AKS runs in a way that is uh, sort of natural and native on top of an Azure Stack HCI cluster. And I want to sort of give you one example of that, specifically in the context of storage. And so here you see a representation of the storage architecture for Azure Stack HCI. Uh, without AKS in the picture, right? Just talking about virtualized workloads in virtual machines. And so very briefly, right, you have a set of industry standard OEM hardware. This could be uh, as few as two nodes or, or or it could be many, many more than that, you know, four, eight, 12, 16, you name it. Uh, and those nodes are running our bare metal operating system, the Azure Stack HCI OS, which expects to be running directly on the metal on those servers. So that sort of gives you, you, you know, what. I guess we'll call the host cluster as sort of the first piece of this puzzle. Now those servers are connected with yeah, high-speed yeah, networking. Say, I know the word cluster becomes really annoying because we use it for Azure Stack HCI and Kubernetes use it and AKS HCI actually deploys two layers of clusters. Yep, and you call one of them host as well. <laughs> yeah, great. We we have the we have the Kubernetes cluster running on the AKS host cluster running on the Azure Stack HCI host cluster. As long as we're all clear that we're the original host cluster, the root, the true, the authentic host cluster. <laughs> um, so you know this is your host cluster, uh, as in the you know the real physical metal, right? Um, those servers are connected by high-speed networking, which is depicted here with the sort of number two. Um, typically, this is at least a single 10 gig link. Uh, more often, it's like at least dual 25 gig links with RDMA. Uh, and that's what provides the software storage bus that uh, is the interconnect for the storage backend. Because of course, we're taking local drives, local SSDs and local HDDs from within these industry standard servers and using them to create our software-defined storage, right? So some of these drives, the faster ones provide caching, uh, the other drives, if there are multiple media types, provide capacity. And then out of the storage from this storage pool, we're going to carve these virtualized data volumes, right? These are cluster shared volumes running typically the REFS file system on top of a storage space. And that is ultimately where virtual machines place their virtual hard disk files, right? VHDs or VHDX files that they can access either from the same node, if that happens to be where they're running, or because of the cluster shared volume namespace, if the virtual machine moves to a different node, that's no problem too, right? It gets like local access to that file. And so virtual machines can fail over, live migrate, uh, be load balanced freely among the different nodes in the one true host cluster, and it's no problem, right? And so this is sort of that uh, storage architecture that if you're familiar with Storage Spaces Direct and with Azure Stack HCI, you've, you've seen this before. But I think it's good to sort of start with this as a review. So now let me show you how 
AKS uh, integrates with this storage architecture in order to mount capacity into a pod of containerized applications running under Kubernetes management. To do that, I'm going to get rid of some of the detail in the bottom part of the picture to create some space. And then we'll have to crack open a few of those virtual machines like Ben showed earlier and talk about what's going on inside. So for illustration, I have a controller VM here. This is one of the, the Kubernetes controller VMs. Of course, it's running a number of uh, pieces of Kubernetes infrastructure, which Ben highlighted a few of them. But the key point is with AKS, you really don't need to know what they all are, actually, um, because it is all managed for you by AKS. And then also, we have a worker node. Um, this could be the Windows or the Linux node. It doesn't actually make a difference for the purpose of this illustration of the architecture. And then inside of that worker node, there's either Windows or Linux. Then there's a container runtime like Docker or Containerd. And then there's the kubelet agent tree and a few other things. And then to be clear, this can be um, one of many, many worker nodes that you would have in this environment. You can even have other virtual machines which are unrelated to Kubernetes running on the same environment. OK, so how does a container get storage? So uh, there's a few pieces that Ben, I think, mentioned uh, that help with this magic. First of all, there's an agent which AKS places on each of the Azure Stack HCI OS instances. And then there's also a clustered agent service, which is a generic service managed by failover clustering that is present on that one true host cluster as well. All right, so let's say we do, like Ben did in his second demo, we take a YAML file that describes a Kubernetes object that we want to run, an application that we want to schedule, and we apply it. And so now we are going to schedule a pod with a containerized application on this worker node that we have here. So I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, but this is what I'm alluding to. We've got a container in a pod no, we, that's going to get we, scheduled you, you on use this your worker node. Reckless abandonment. <laughs> Terrific. Now, if this application uh, is not stateful, then this, we don't need storage anyway. So this is kind of you know moot. Let's assume that this application is, in fact, a stateful application. It could be a database uh, or some kind of a tier that inter interacts with the data um, for, say, a big website or a big application. In that case, the containerized app running in this pod is going to make a claim for persistent storage. It is going to say, look, I need a persistent volume, please, so that I can re write files and then read them back later um, as part of just you know being run by Kubernetes. When that happens, the Kubernetes core infrastructure uh, recognizes that, hey, I'm going to need to actually create a persistent volume or find one if there's one already created in order to fulfill this persistent volume claim from this pod. And to do that, it reaches out to an original piece of software that is part of the AKS on HCI solution that was written by the Storage Spaces Direct team specifically to make this possible, which is our MSVHD CSI provisioner. So in Kubernetes, there, uh, there are two interfaces that are very important uh, that are standardized. One of them is the container networking interface, CNI. The other one is the container storage interface, CSI. And what you're seeing here, the sort of block number eight in this picture, is a CSI, container storage interface provisioner, specifically in order so, so that you can use storage spaces direct with these containers. So that provisioner is going to reach down to the clustered agent service running on the host cluster. It will route the call to the node where we're actually going to provision the storage. And then the agent on that node is going to create a VHD file if a new persistent volume needs to be created. And that VHD file will get mounted to the worker node where Kubernetes is going to schedule this pod and therefore needs to also schedule the persistent volume that this pod is claiming. So this VHD file, of course, will get perceived as a disk by this worker node. Uh, inside, our agent tree will format it if it's not already formatted, like if this is something we just created new. Um, and then that the storage on this formatted disk within the worker node gets mounted into the container namespace of the pod that we just scheduled so that when the application actually starts running, which as Ben showed you, just takes a, a brief moment. So everything I just described happens in just a couple of seconds. When the pod starts running, when the app comes up, it can write files to the location that it expects in its local container file system. And underneath, that is actually being backed by this VHD file sitting on top of Azure Stack HCI. Now, what's really nice is that having this native integration between AKS and the underlying storage from Azure Stack HCI means that the containers that you're running benefit from all of the features that you know and love 
from Azure Stack HCI and from Storage Spaces Direct. So if you are a fan of nested resiliency, or if you're a fan of the performance gains that come from read-write caching with NVMe drives, uh, or anything like that, all of that accrues to the containers that you run on AKS on HCI. It all just works. So I think this is pretty cool. And I wanted to use this as an example of the kind of custom work that complements the shared code of AKS and AKS on HCI to really make this whole solution possible. Uh, anything you want to add, Ben? Oh, I'll actually jump in. There's been a, a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. That, that, uh, so there was a question, can this uh, CSI be used outside of AKS HCI? Um, so we are, we have not yet released the, the AKS HCI CSI as uh, open source. We are planning to. Uh, the team is uh, working on making the code as pretty as possible. <laughs> but we are planning to make it an open source project. Um, can it be used outside of AKS HCI? Possibly. Um, we, we are intending to make it open source so that people can play with it and, and try different uh, scenarios. Uh, and then uh, Elmar uh, asked uh, how those VHDX files backed up. Um, so the the short answer here is frustratingly the state of kubernetes backup is nowhere near as advanced or elegant as i would like it to be um fortunately uh they are vhdx files and we know how to back those up um uh, uh, so if you're running uh, AKS uh, HCI and you're using a bunch of persistent storage, um, you can actually go in and, and back up those VHD files um, that, that we create um, using any backup software that supports Hyper-V. Um, we're also looking into different options. There are a number of uh, Kubernetes backup solutions uh, out there. Uh, unfortunately, nowhere, none of them are anywhere near as uh, elegant uh, as we would like. Um, I will say I know we have a number of Veeam Vanguard uh, on the call, so feel free to go and uh, uh, chat to your, your friends at Veeam and say that they should be reaching out to us to try and come up with something awesome for, for backing up AKS HCI. Um, yeah, ben, I'm sure do something there. Ben, thanks for the call out. Uh, Didier is also giving a comment. Uh, I have a question. Is the VHDX owned by any VM? So it could be backed up with the VM? Or is it independently uh, flowing around in the Azure Stack HCI cluster? So what, what happens is, uh, to just kind of step through the, the mechanics of this, um, you know, when, when we deploy a container, um, we have a VHD, we have a central VHD store. Um, the, the VHD that's associated with that container gets hot added to the, the, the worker node where it's running. And if we need to move the container for any reason, um, if there's a servicing event, if there's an unplanned failover, if there's a load balance, um, we do a hot remove and a hot add. So it will always be connected, as long as the container is running, it will be connected to the VM that it's running on. And that, that's actually a good segue into the the follow-up question that was asked, which is, what if I need to share that disk um, between containers running on multiple worker nodes? So it's it's a good question. So in that that is in the roadmap. Yeah, there it there it is again. Yeah. So uh, there's. I, I suspect... Do you come to the roadmap in the presentation because we are already uh, 75 minutes and going? I, I, I and I love I, this. I will not stop this. But uh... I think I put uh, I put a link to it. But, yeah. Uh... Uh, we do. So we, I, I will take a moment to just call out. We do actually have a, a publicly published roadmap for uh, Azure Stack uh, HCI. Um, let me actually uh, bring it up, and I will share it in just a second. Yeah. Uh, while you're while you're doing that, um, to to the question about um, uh, uh, storage being mounted onto multiple worker nodes at the same time. So. I, I suspect the person who asked this question knows uh, in Kubernetes, there is a well-established concept of read, write once or read, write many access. Yep. And the MSVHD provisioner in its current form in the first public preview of AKS and HCI only offers uh, read, write once access, meaning that the storage can only be mounted into a single worker node at a time. You can absolutely have multiple pods running on that worker node. So you could have you know, two replicas of the same pod, for example, and they could both both access it. Um, but we will be bringing read, write, many access, meaning that multiple different worker nodes can all access the same storage um, 
by delivering actually a uh, second complementary CSI provisioner a little bit later for AKS and HCI. Yeah, so, uh, and one of the things I'll call out, I, I'm sharing now, we do have a publicly uh, uh, accessible uh, roadmap um, where uh, you can come here and you can look at what's in the roadmap. Um, anything that we actively have engineers working on right now, um, we have in the in progress. This is actually very short because we very small right now because we are hoping to release an update to the public preview any day now. Um, so we I, have a, I, I tried it by the way. Um, I can confirm that that thing is fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we then have our, our planned, and this is all the this is a long list of stuff that we have on the to do list um, that we we have engineers who have looked at it and gone like yes that is something that we are going to do, um, and every month we look at stuff in the planned we move it across to the in progress, uh, and uh, as a number of you are aware. Um, you can also come here, you can report bugs, file issues, make enhancement requests. Um, we will triage them, um, get them tagged as enhancements, bugs, documentation, and then we'll get them queued up uh, in the roadmap. Um, so you can have a look at that. Um, a couple of other questions uh, that I'm looking at here. Uh, Didier I, had the, sorry, you were going to say something? Oh, uh, and I, I can take the NFS and SMB one when, when you get to it. Absolutely. I'll, uh, so uh, Didier had the question about we are seeing heated debates that containers should be stateless or not. Uh, yeah, we at Microsoft are squarely in the uh, people have data that they care about camp. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I am well for aware. The, of for the record, Storage Spaces Direct team here uh, agrees with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, Please explain we are not native speakers mostly. So what is we are not in the we don't care about camp. So you mean there was a period of time there where uh, a number of people in the Kubernetes and container space were saying uh, containers should be stateless, um, which as a platforms engineer uh, made me very angry because Anytime someone said container should be stateless, what they were actually saying is, I have a big old database over there that I'm not going to containerize, and that's where I keep all my state. Um, and we do not agree with that at all. Uh, obviously, we have the SQL team that has been working on containerized versions of SQL um, that persist your storage. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, we think, uh, you know, we think there's a, we think there is a lot of value to state separation, um, which is what we we deliver in the platform. We you know you have your container, you have your persistent storage. Those are very different things, um, and and you should think about those as different things. But um, you you need state. Yeah. If um, if you're if you have a, a developer team that has an application that they believe it is most convenient for them to package and deploy as a Kubernetes object, um, they're gonna want the database to be part of that too, right? Not yeah. just not just the web tier or the middle tier. Like you want to you want to containerize the whole app, and that's gonna include a stateful a stateful component if your app does anything meaningful at all. And and, and also if you care about performance, <laughs> you know, because that that was one of the particular frustrating things is we'd see a lot of people talking about like. Uh, you know, having stateless applications, and it's like, okay, so you're going to have a cluster that runs all your business logic and all your front end, and then you're going to have a separate cluster for your 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 state. Um, and it's like, it's a lot better performance uh, to do this hyperconverged, um, to have all those uh, applications running uh, side by side. Um, you know, often not having to even leave the box in order to to talk to each other over networking. Hey Ben, could I offer you some IOPS? We have lots of IOPS. I would know. You, would you would you like yeah. some IOPS? I definitely would. <laughs> uh, just so, just uh, a little addition. Um, the the thing with VLAN tagging, this is most important for many people I work with. So it has to work with VLAN tagging. Yes, that that uh, I I hope that we will have an update any moment now that uh, has VLAN tagging. Our, okay, our it's included in the next one. 
Cool. That and, is and, and also also static addresses. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So uh, the question about uh, NFS and uh, uh, SMB3, Cosmos? Uh, yeah, so I, I was going to give a two-part answer there, and then Ben can add anything if he feels that I... I and maybe you go back where to. we get this great thing. You have some download information there, right? Yeah. Because people yeah. have to pop out. We are still at 102, but uh, they are leaving because they have to work. <laughs> it's it's the morning. <laughs> it's, even, it's, even the, it's even the morning here. Um, so, so the two-part answer on the NFS and SMB question. Um, First of all, you know, our focus with Azure Stack HCI is very much on providing storage to the applications that are running on the same cluster, right? That's what hyper-converged infrastructure means. So we don't have any plans right now to do like arbitrary sharing of storage from Azure Stack HCI into other servers or other things in your environment that might want to consume storage. That's really not a focus for us. We're focused on the apps that are running on the same cluster. With that said, how are we going to deliver read write many storage uh, through our CSI provisioner for scenarios that need that with AKS on HCI. Uh, internally, yes, the answer is we are going to be using uh, file sharing like technology, including our internal uh, component tree for SMB and for NFS. Anything you want to add to that, Ben? No, that is pretty much spot on. All right, well then back to you. Uh, I have I have put up our set of links here. Uh, the most important one that I will call out is uh, AKS HCI Evaluate. Um, that's where you can go to, to get the download and get started. Um, and also if you look at AKS HCI Docs, we have getting started tutorials. Um, and as, as uh, Cosmos mentioned, and as I have demonstrated, so I, the, the demo environment that I was running here, I was actually running that all nested on my desktop. I have a lovely, I'm going to make uh, Elmar happy. This isn't a Dell server, but I have an Alienware desktop that I love. Um, so that's Dell branded. Um, but it's uh, it's just got 64 gig of RAM, and I can set up the entire environment uh, nested running on top of Hyper-V. So it is super easy uh, to, to play uh, with and, and get going. And you, have to make, will... you have to make an important life choice, whether you use that computer for Microsoft Flight Simulator or for Azure Kubernetes Service. You know, <laughs> it's, 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 it is it is like I have made the foolish, uh, I have the foolish uh, situation as a working from home person that my work computer is definitely a better gaming computer than my gaming computer. So um, I have I have an important question for, for Ben. What yep. games... Do you have containerized and running in uh, oh, Azure Stack H? Yes. Yeah. No, that <laughs> give, is give me the, the give me please the links to the to the downloads, please. I, I am working on a series of blog posts about uh, my containerized uh, game farm. So, uh, what I the the two things that I have been working on the the obvious one is a a highly scalable Minecraft uh, uh, backend. Uh, but the, the one that I'm actually really uh, fond of uh, is if you've ever used, there's an open source project uh, called DOSBox, which is great for running DOS games. Um, someone did a Java version of that that you can set up cool. as a server, um, and you can run that in a container uh, to do on-demand uh, DOS games of your choice. I and have you, to have this because I need I need examples to run in in the Kubernetes cluster. I yes. really have to yeah, have no, it. I, I, that is that is uh, that, uh, that is one of my side projects for the next couple of months. Uh, so yeah, I'll definitely <laughs> I'll definitely have some fun stuff that I'm going to be running about. And okay. now you now you know the secret. Why did we start building Azure Stack HCI all those years ago? It was all exactly. leading leading up to this to <laughs> yeah. playing DOS games in a container. On an That's so cool. <laughs> and these games are available even maybe uh, Cosmos when you are not really uh, on this world, or? They're even available when one of your servers goes down, they fail over. Yes, yeah, they do. <laughs> exactly. So uh, if there are some questions, we are. I, I love this webinar, but we are nearly at 90 minutes, so 85 minutes now. If there are final questions you want to ask uh, these two guys, because we don't get them together, I have only seen them in Redmond together in one room. So ask your questions. This is a, this is a final call, and uh, then we have to wrap it up. Uh, and we of course, this webinar will be available as on YouTube. Yeah. yeah, we still have 110 attendees, so we're still answering questions. Yeah, 
we have still 100 attendees. Un mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Come on, last final question. No one? No questions. So, Cosmos and Ben, last words for the webinar? So well, I, my, my big ask is, yes, go play with it. Uh, we'd love to, to hear feedback. Um, I'd love to see what people can do with it. Um, I'm super excited, um, and I'm really looking forward to, to uh, continuing to, to iterate on this and bring new features in. Yep, and let me just say thank you everyone for, for attending and for sticking around so long. We really have had 100 attendees for the last 90 minutes, which is yeah. which is really terrific to see. Thank you, and um, I hope that we'll get to do this again sometime. I I do too. So a big thanks to both of you. You you know you are both my heroes, and can't wait to talk you, to you too. And uh, Ben, I need I need good examples for containers because that I'm really yeah, missing. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we can uh, do a follow-up mail, and I will share it with uh, with the webinar attendees because the biggest problem for me is if you have it running, what to do now? Yeah. Doom, doom, or it doesn't count. Doom, no, or it... I, I definitely, I definitely have doom already working. <laughs> okay, I, I need that download. So thanks a lot. Uh, I will finish up, uh, up this now. Thanks for all the attendees and. Uh, the right date for the next webinar is in the follow-up mail. So uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.